Hi everyone, welcome to the lost generation outside of the mainstream. My name is William Hooker. I am a musician, poet, and part of this generation of artists. My goal with this podcast, which is being broadcast on its own YouTube channel and my website, williamhooker.com, is to introduce you to many of the musical artists that are outside of the mainstream and have made important artistic contributions to our culture. I have also interviewed producers of the music and many fans and supporters of this work. My guests are sharing what makes this art form unique and significant. I hope these conversations will inspire you to listen to the music, which may change you and the way you view music, which again is outside of the mainstream. Today, I am interviewing photographer and historical documentarian, Enid Farber. Just a note, All those that are listening and have access to this podcast, we'd like your suggestions on people who to interview, as well as how to communicate with more people through our podcast. Enjoy as I interview again, photographer Enid Farber. I hope to be airing new interviews on the first of each month. We are presenting these interviews and we have so many amazing interviews coming up that you will be hearing in the future. This is The Lost Generation Outside of the Mainstream. This is a story that needs to be told. Okay, catch me off guard. It's rolling. I am interviewing Enid Farber. Hi, William. Photographer and documentarian of musicians and artists worldwide. Please, briefly tell us a little about yourself. So I specialize in music photography, particularly jazz, although I do shoot other types of music on occasion used to shoot a lot of reggae and African music, but not as much anymore. I started in 1979 with Bob Marley. And I graduated to, to Cecil Taylor when I moved to New York. <laughs> That's just the range there, just to give you an example. So I'm, uh, I'm in New York since 85 and uh, covering as much music as I can as often as I can. It's my passion, it's my calling, and it's also, I would say, not so much an occupation, but I use it, for me, it's fine art. That's my approach, and history. Absolutely, absolutely. Where are you from, Enid? I am born in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I've lived all up and down the East Coast, but. Before New York, I was in Atlanta, and that's where I cut my teeth in music photography. Atlanta. Atlanta. All right, all right. I'm gonna ask you a series of questions, Mm -hmm. and I want you to elaborate as much as possible about whatever this question, however the question hits you. Okay. The first question is, as a photographer, mm-hmm. when you take a picture, you carry, I'm sorry, you capture Thank you. a very intimate side of an artist. Their expressions, their gestures, and the like. Would you elaborate on the musicians of my generation? Mm-hmm specifically the 70s, that you have 
photographed and what you gathered about them from your art form. And you could take that any place you want to, but I would like to really focus on this particular generation. Well, it's a little difficult because I've shot so many artists. I, I, when you say the 70s, not a, obviously not born in the 70s, but who had their, I mean, the, the, the heyday of their career, or what exactly do you mean about this? What are you referring to? And, I'm referring to that particular period of this music, which was called mm -hmm. either the loft jazz scene mm -hmm. or the free jazz scene that, em that came from right. uh, the historical uh, things that Cecil Taylor laid down, mm -hmm. John Coltrane laid down, and Ornette Coleman laid down. That okay. what happened directly afterward, you don't have to use specific names, but um, just what was uh, sure. your idea about that? I mean. You know, I, I, I moved to New York in 85, so I missed that. I did not document that. Um, was my work influenced by that? I mean, I was, I was in Atlanta. I had a, where I started doing photography. I had, you know, there was, there was in, in Atlanta, we had maybe two great jazz events a month, which is why I moved to New York, because here you have, 500 things a month that you, so much per night, you can't even choose where to go. You're, it's a kid in a candy store. I knew I needed to be here. But, so some of the jazz musicians of that period that were in Atlanta that I photographed early on, I would say Pharaoh Sanders was the first one of that ilk, if you will, smooth jazz. That was absolutely never on my radar. Um, so from there, I shot everyone from you know Lionel Hampton to my first time shooting Miles Davis to um, you know some of the great singers Ella and Sarah Vaughan and I came to New York because this is where they all lived. Right. And that's and that's when I became. I, then the Visions Festival came to the Vision Festival. Sorry, I always say Visions. Vision Festival became part of my scene. I don't even know how, but I went to the first Vision Festival, probably was their second year. And I just became, you know, addicted to the to the whole scene. Not not necessarily running home and buying the records. I loved the whole climate, the visual climate, the music, it the art, the people, the hang. It became very it, it was like a family reunion every year, so I became more familiar with artists that I didn't necessarily have access to before that. Um, and and that I, I think that's what, it, it, for me, there was this very strong visual component. For instance, when it was at um, the Orensons and the, the, the lighting and the backgrounds, and it just, it all, you know, wove together to make it just so much, so exciting. So I'm not sure that answers your question, and I also am not trying to make this about the Vision Festival, but I would say that's where I had my most exposure. Not all of it. I mean, I photographed Cecil Taylor and Max Roach at their 12-year reunion, a 10-year sure. reunion. Sure. I think it was a 10-year reunion at um, Town Hall. You know, I photographed them and many, many others in many other settings, not just that, that once a year gathering. But that's what I would say is the festival that I look forward to the most. To elaborate on um, your capturing of the images mm -hmm. of people and the intimacy you get from, fo fo from photography, um, how do you see uh, what how do you see what you see? You know, I have a very, I think I have the, the best answer that I'll have all day. What, what has always attracted me to photography, it, it, it's through the great photojournalist. I mean, I, I, yes, I love some of the studio music photographers. I mean, the, you know, Herman Leonard's and what they, he did with lighting. But the one photographer who, res, who, who I never met, but whose 
whose uh, vision of, of capturing was Henri Cartier-Bresson, because he had this, he coined the phrase, the decisive moment. And for me, that is everything in any image that I take. It's the idea that there is never going to be another exact second capture fleeting moment ever. I mean, for me, it, I, yes, there are, when you're shooting in the pit with 50 other photographers, sometimes at, for instance, the Charlie Parker Jazz Festival, which they just, it's just, I don't even know where everybody comes from, but it's such a, a, a glut, you know, and it's hard to not get a unique image necessarily, but, you know, out of all the images that I shoot, I find that one that, that captures that essence. Right. And I feel like if, if I, if, I mean, I, this might sound a little corny, but it is this photographic equivalent of improvisation, I think. Mm-hmm. So that's, wow. that's what I look for. Right. That's and what, um, what are you trying to express in terms of your expression of this art? Because you've talked about the, the, that moment. Can you elaborate a little bit more about what you mean about that moment and the person that's playing this music? Mm -hmm. um, again, jazz is, if I just talk about jazz, it's just such a, uh, you know, expressive idiom and it's just so passionate and it's so, um, and it's intellectual too, but I, I don't, I, I want those photos to have that energy of the of the artist's soul. And again, that sounds kind of corny. No, that's sure right. That oh. Every you know photographer that really has devoted their life to that to that genre mm -hmm. feels, feels that way. But um, I had a show once, an exhibition that I entitled "The Camera as My Instrument." Somebody said it should be called the camera is my instrument. I don't know what difference there is there, but it, it, I came up with that title because I felt like I too can play through my camera. I didn't study music, but at one point I really thought I would, you know, do play an instrument. My brother played the piano. Um, and you know, music was just very important in our family. Mm -hmm. So I played violin for about 20 minutes in the fifth grade, you know, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> maybe a little longer. Mm -hmm. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I didn't have the discipline, I didn't have the focus, I didn't have the, the drive at that age. Uh, and I was just all over the place with, you know, I mean, at, at that age, who knew, at least not me. Um, yeah, so I, I think that when the first professional camera landed in my lap and it, mm -hmm. it literally kind of did. Um, I, I knew that, that I had to use it to, to photograph music and musicians because I had always had, was always drawn to that. Right, right. So, yeah, um, that's, that's pretty much how it all came together. I'm not sure if that was the question. Absolutely, but, well, but I mean, your elaboration, your elaboration is what's important. And now, what are some of the challenges you face when you're uh, you're um, taking pictures and, and photographing musicians. What are some of the challenges as a as a uh, as a um, you know photographer? Um, sometimes it just comes down to respect. You know. Um, How do you mean? Yeah, that's that's a, that's very personal. Um, I've been out there a long time. I think I've paid my dues, but I'm not always treated like that. Um, I find like I have to kind of take a stance. Maybe that makes me become a little aloof because I don't feel like I belong sometimes because I just, it's just, I'm doing it for me, you know, and I'm doing it for a need of, of expressing myself again through the camera. That brings us back to that previous question that mm -hmm. I got lost. Um, yeah, through the camera, because I can't, I can't be on stage. I, maybe I fancied myself at one point expressing myself through an instrument, but 
so it's it's just it's it's a it's a primal need for me to be able to you know i i feel like when i'm listening to the i can't go to a concert for instance uh-huh. without and enjoy it without a camera i mean people invite me to their gigs all the time and either i'm not going to say well put me on the guest list so can i shoot you know i don't feel that they can all i just don't feel right asking that all the time i feel like you know if they wanted me to come and shoot they would have invited me and said hey i'll put you on the guest list but when i'm there i feel like i am part of the music i feel like i'm part of the band in a way because okay. it's, it's my way of, of i i've absolutely really i i was saying i just don't have a good time when i'm there not shooting because i see i experience the music through my through my lens wow yeah. yes i do that's yeah all right and and to and to um add on to that what does your experience with photography reveal about the differences between the generations of musicians what does it reveal about, about the, the generations of musicians that you are actually taking pictures of um that i don't have a good answer for um i'm not i'm not I, well i'm asking that, that i'm asking that in yeah. because what i'm trying to circle what mm -hmm. i'm trying both of us to walk down this path mm -hmm. and figure out mm -hmm. is the musicians that came in the 70s right and those who came up before us have a certain approach and i know you can see that through the intimacy of 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 the kind of of the kind of pictures you take what have you seen any sort of differentiation between the younger musicians or the musicians of the 70s and the older musicians who you mentioned i mean i how do you see that is, there's there's more formality now probably how do you mean well I, I think that you know there's a lot more educational opportunities that people come out of those those institutions some of them play with so much heart and soul and others play with like uh, you know i was taught to <laughs> to do this the scale and this is how you you know you've been taught in a more mechanical way okay and i i don't know that and, and i feel like you know people are now may may be struggling to to have a have this generational definition you know that was so natural and innate to the 70s where the, where these people just they picked up the horn and they just it was like the camera is for me and again i don't want to sound corny but it really was just attached their third appendage you know kind of thing it, it's like you you didn't need to be educated it's good if you could be but right. they were self i'm self-taught i'm self-taught i i don't know that that has been a benefit for me but it it was my i didn't have the opportunity to go to art school and to um and it and it before i turned 50 which i don't even know which year i but i went back to school okay i went back to get my to finish my my undergrad degree mm -hmm. and and I thought that's going to really help me with my credentials and stuff, but it didn't. And I didn't go to art school. I went to Empire State College. You can design your own degree. And it was called a photography degree. Okay. But I had to write essays that, to prove all my life learning. So that's really what it was based on. Right. Did it help me? Did it make me a better photographer or make me a better negotiator or any of the things I need in business? Um, no but it did give me a sense of accomplishment. Okay. But my point is, I feel like these, the 70s generation is more coming from the self-taught, not having all those educational opportunities to learn music, you know, uh, academically. Mm -hmm. So. But do you see that, do you see that in the picture? When you come to our gigs and you look and you right. say, oh, that was smoking. I get it. I get it. Because I know, I know you're, we, I, when I look out there yeah. myself, yeah. I know you're out there with me. Yeah. I know that. And I'm just saying that, right? Because um, does that reveal itself to you as opposed to the people that preceded me? Like, um, you know, the people that preceded me specifically. And some, sometimes or I, us, I'm yeah, sorry, us yeah. in the 70s. 
sometimes I think that um, those those musicians are having more a more intimate experience and more and more fun, you know. Huh? Go. Yeah. Go with that. Yeah. Yeah. Like. And again, it's 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 so it's niche, but it's also very, um, you know, there's a, it's a sense of community more than than I get from these musicians who only play at the big institutions and get paid a lot. So there is something hmm. about, you know, people are still struggling. There's some, that sense of struggle, I think, and I think I identify with that, and I think that's what makes it. You know, I never thought about this until you asked it, but I seriously think that I still struggle. Mm -hmm. I really do. I get my work out there, but I don't have enough financial opportunities and enough, you know, support and backing from whatever. There's not the publications that I used to work for. They don't really buy the photography anymore. They get a lot of, you know, people, even writers, just take cell phone shots and that's what they use. They're not, mm. yeah. So it's it's gotten to be a little less uh, of an opportunity to support yourself. Right. And right. I I think there's that, that that identify with that when I go to these festivals where these particular people that we're mentioning that I put down on a list of paper, thinking of you know everyone from. Um, um, Cecil, I mentioned him again. I don't know why he keeps coming up in my mind. So many others. Why does uh, he keep coming up in your mind? Um, you know, because he was he was like you know such an important part of that that scene. He was he was the one of these probably the most one of the most celebrated and right. You know, I uh, I mean there again. Um, well, I have to look at my list because well, I'm, I'm getting well, stumped well, about <laughs> so well, many. Well, There's so many. I mean, I, I think the first person I wrote down was Don, you know, Don Cherry, Don pulling in at Blackwell because I have this incredible photo and it wasn't from right. the Vision Festival. They're all gone. But what I'm trying to elaborate on is, and you mentioned the word celebrated. Yeah. The lost generation outside of the mainstream is about those that have not been celebrated right, exactly. and have made significant, right. significant um, contributions to our culture exactly. as a whole. Exactly. And this is our effort to rewrite that history mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because um, once, you, once you deal with a certain amount of celebration, it's almost as if that's the that's the way to roll to right. get a job right. To, right. to get to get to play in the magazines that don't exist anymore hardly mm -hmm. or, or to to be uh, to have to have the resources to hold a band together and that's one thing yeah. that out of the, out of this whole 70s generation mm -hmm. where we had to put on our gigs in our lofts right, right. in our homes the ladies fort um, you know, uh, Ali's Alley, uh, you know, um, these kinds of places, Enveron. Craig Harris is doing that in his home. He's you know, one he, of our generation. Yes, he's doing that because he's, you know, I saw the interview um, with him and the alternative jazz venues that, um, that Gail Boyd started an online blog, uh, video blog. Right. And, you know, he talked about, look, um, we may not make any money, but at these, at these, uh, home concerts or, sure. or you know lost scenes but um you know we might get exposed to a european promoter who hears what we do and then you know they know they know find out about us and invite us to their festival overseas so uh people are just especially now i mean there's again like magazines with photography there's so few now that pay how many jazz clubs are there that you know that pay well or <laughs> You don't have to get handouts at the door, right? Right. So, um, you know, I, I think that's a great thing that that's still being done. But again, I wasn't here during that scene, but I got to photograph many. Uh, I, I did, somebody came to my mind, like, that's an unsung person who's, I, I think about a lot of the photos of people who are gone, because I made a, a template of a book called Legends Who Have Passed Through My Lens. and. I thought I just. What is that again? Say it again, legends please. Legends who have passed through my lens. I think I've seen yeah. it. It's beautiful. Yeah, and I did a show. I did. I did an exhibition in this neighborhood that uh, of that work first, and then I decided, yeah, that that's a 
that's a book I'd like to do. So, um, but Frank Lowe came to mind. You know, remember Frank Lowe? I mean, he was so unsung. And he's, he's a musician's musician. I think of a lot of these people that you're talking about as musicians' musicians. You know, that they know, respect, admire, but they just didn't get the kind of commercial success. Maybe that's why I identify with them, you know? That's beautiful because that's, you, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, my last question to you would be, what do you think our generation, and you just mentioned mm -hmm. one of the people, two of the people, our generation contributed to this music and in general, the culture of music from our standpoint, America. What do you think um, is our contribution? Wow. That's, so, that's, that's separated from right. prior to us. Right. Because, I mean, we cannot, I mean, if you look at my, my books up there, yeah. you can see I have, you know, um, Four Lives, I have uh, As Serious As Your Life, sure. I have all of these things. What do you think is, when you look at a Frank Lowe, you look at a Craig mm -hmm. Harris or like that, what is our, our contribution? I mean, to me, it's, it's you know, jazz is known as America's original musical art form. But what do people think about when they think about that? They think about, you know, New Orleans. They think about, you know, swing and, and perhaps uh, Dixieland and early bop, you know. Oh. But there, this generation showed that there's so much more complexity and so much more originality and, and so much more uh, broadening, you know, of, of that concept of jazz and improvisation. So, you know, people still, a lot of the mainstream don't know this generation's type of music if, if we're calling, you know, that's what you're calling the lost generation. Um, yeah, but they, they made a stance and said, hey, you know, we don't have to just keep it in the, the box. We're going outside the box and uh, and here we are, you know, like it or leave it. <laughs> <laughs> Eat it. Yes. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you for you. staying and being inside the box and yeah. outside of the box there at the go. same time. That's right. Because that takes persistence. Thank you. It takes heart. And amongst other things, it really takes a, uh, a supreme love for mm -hmm. the art form that you're, you're a photographer of. Enid, it's an honor for you to thank for you. me to have you here. It was an honor to It you really have is. Me. All right, thank you, Enid. I really Enid. appreciate it. Enid Farber. You're welcome. Bye. <laughs> thank you for tuning in. In months ahead, you will have the opportunity to hear from many more lost generation artists and supporters. The audio only version is available wherever you get your podcast. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to hear upcoming episodes.